All right, you guys up for some serious gearhead nerd stuff? Now, I know I am, and since you already clicked on this, you might as well stick around and take the ride, right? I want to talk about a topic that I never see anybody cover, but it's universal. It applies to all engines, but we're going to talk specifically about American-style pushrod engines, V8, inlines, doesn't make any difference. They all have the same basic characteristics. Oil control, top-end oil control. So what made me think of this is that we did the video the other day on the guys putting LS rockers on small block Mopars. And towards the end of the video, I says that I do have some misgivings about top-end oil control. But I realized afterwards, I said, man, that's really vague. And I think I need to do a whole video on this because it's an important topic. If you're just disassembling and reassembling or you're using parts that are pre-designed to fit together. None of this stuff really has to be taken into consideration because it's all engineered in there. But what you have to understand is that when an engineer sits down to design an engine, they don't just sketch this thing out willy-nilly in a napkin and pass it off to the foundry and say, here, cast me this up. There's a lot of thought that goes into the design of an engine. Every possible contingency, every possible uh, aspect of the engine's operating range, RPM, everything is all taken into consideration when components are designed. So if you're just disassembling and reassembling, stuff really never never enters the, the equation, never enters the picture. But if you're hot rodding, if you're mixing and matching components, you really need to know this stuff because it can cause, things that you don't realize can cause serious issues, unforeseen problems. And top-end oil control, well, it, you know, in a worst-case scenario, you don't get enough oil up to the top. Uh, in a not-so-bad situation, you can flood the top of an engine. It was very common, really, before, before these things were taken into consideration, uh, it was very common for high RPM engines to pump all of their oil up into the valve covers, and by the time they get to the finish line, they're out of oil because too much got up there. So when you start to hot rod, you start to mix and match components, you need to take these things into consideration. So what I want to cover here is the different aspects that, or the different factors that go into limiting or regulating the oil that gets to the top end of an engine. This is not Mopar specific. This, isn't, this has nothing to do with putting LS rockers on a small block. It's not Mopar specific. I am going to use Mopar parts to illustrate because that's what I have. So, you know, but where there are differences to other manufacturers, I'll point that out. So, and we're not talking about full, full race engines. Full race engine, you know, you've got bush lifter bores and stuff like that. And, and because part of oil control, overall oil control is the amount of oil that's allowed to escape past the lifters. So the fit of the lifter into the bore has to be exactly just right so that it's free enough to rotate, but not free enough to let oil just bleed past. And that's a problem. That's a, a problem common to older engines where there is lifter bore wear, and you just can't get oil pressure out of them because the main oil galleys intersect the lifter bores, and once the lifter gets sloppy in there, the oil just... just you know, it, 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 it's a, it just hemorrhages out between the lifter and the bore. But I don't want to get into that. I want to talk about just factory components and how they're laid out and the considerations when you do make modifications, things you need to look at. And there's a lot to it. So what I did here is I rounded up five lifters. Four of them, they're all from running engines. They're all used lifters. Four of them are from traditional Chrysler V8s. The fifth is not, but it's important to put in here, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. So here's the setup. You guys got to excuse, it's hard to film this kind of thing with one hand, so if it's a little shaky or anything like that, you know, forgive me. But here's the setup I have. Okay, so the first thing's first. This These five lifters from left to right this is a basic solid. This is a more generic solid. This is a hydraulic, a regular production hydraulic out of a late 70s, early 80s, 318. This is an AMC lifter, and this one came out of a Jeep 4.0. I'm going to get to this in a minute. And then this is out of a Magnum. Now, 
This tube here represents, and that's why it's important that they all came from the same type of engine. This tube here represents the base circle of the camshaft because on all of the Chrysler small blocks, whether it's a, a early LA or a Magnum, the relationship between the base circle of the cam and the oil galley is the same. So here's the base circle of the cam. All of these lifters are bottomed out against the base circle. Obviously, I can't do this inside of an engine, but the oil galley intersects right about here when these things are sitting at rest, when they're all sitting on that base circle. So it's just an important visualization. All right. Now, I included these two because this one here has a pretty unique quality, and this one is applicable to certain engines that oil through the push rods. Now, remember, these engines, none of these engines, these three, oil through the push rods. These all oil through the rockers. But from left to right, this is the most basic solid lifter you could ever find. It's just a solid block, and this section has been taken out of it, this hourglass section. Now, that was done for two reasons, and there is a benefit to this, an oiling benefit to this. This was cut out of here to lighten the lifter because it's just a solid block here. But also, you have to remember that the oil galley is round, okay, and it intersects, or the lifter, I should say, intersects the oil galley. There is a partial obstruction to the oil galley by the body of the lifter. So by making this hourglass shape like this, not only do you take weight away, but you eliminate any intrusion of the lifter body into the bore. If you're looking for the to send the absolute last molecule of oil through the system, through the, through the oil galleys, then this would be the optimum lifter to use. But this type of lifter never has any use in a pushrod oiling style motor. So let's just get this thing out of the way. This lifter is a, the typical common solid lifter. It shares the same body as the hydraulic lifter, but it's not drilled for oil. Now, if this was, a, and this is on, on a Chrysler, the Chrysler, remember, that the, the engine that this lifter would go to oils through the rocker shifts, not the push rods. Now, let's just say this was a Chevrolet that does oil through the push rods. Well, in that case, you would have a hole like this one, someplace in about the same height at the very, very top of the oil galley, where the lifter intersects the oil galley, and there would be a hole here and then a matching hole in the push rod cup. And that's where your oil would go to. Now, the height and the diameter of this hole is important because the higher it is in relation to the oil galley, the less time it's exposed. So, and I, okay, we'll get to that in a second. But that's the only difference between a solid lifter from a rocker shaft oiled engine like a Chrysler or a solid lifter like from a push rod oiled engine like a Chevy. So we've, we're good with that. Let's roll this one out of the way. Okay, now we get to these three, and this is important, all right? Um, all right this one is from, like I said, a, a late 70s, early 80s, 318 production engine. This is an AMC Jeep lifter. This is actually out of a 4.0 Jeep. Now, you can see they're just about exactly identical to each other, and here's an important thing to know for you Mopar guys. If you order a cam and lifters from like any of the manufacturers over the last, you know, like 15 years or so, when you order lifters, you get these, you don't get these. The main difference between them is that these Chrysler specific lifters don't have provision for pushrod oiling. And so the hole is smaller on this one than it is on this AMC one. And like I said, this is what you get. So now to illustrate the size difference, that's the standard Chrysler V8 with rocker shift oiling. And here's the feed hole size for the AMC. And you can see the hole is about 25, 30% larger, which means that more overall, more oil volume is going to be able to pass through this lifter. So this hole only has to feed the plunger part of the lifter, but this hole has to feed the plunger part of the lifter and send oil to the top end. Now, there's another factor here, too, and it's called, it's called the piddle valve. 
And that's what this is. This is a piddle valve. So this sits on top of the plunger inside the lifter. And then this push rod cup sits on top of it. Now, here's something. Here's, here's where you can get yourself in a lot of trouble with stuff like this. The piddle valve requires some push rod preload to stay closed. So when it's closed, you can see there's a little tiny notch right here at the top of the push rod cup. That little notch is the only area that oil is allowed to pass through. Now, the piddle valve makes it oil pressure sensitive. So if there's no resistance on the piddle valve in the form of preload on the push rod, then the piddle valve becomes very oil pressure sensitive and it'll send an abundance of oil to the top. So if you want to hot rod your engine and let's say you're shooting for zero lash and using this type of lifter, you're going to have a huge amount of volume, more so than is supposed to travel to the top, pass through here because the oil pressure will push the piddle valve off its seat on the cup and it's just going to let oil pass through those holes directly to the top end. You can you would be amazed. The whole everything looks relatively small here, but you would be amazed under pressure how much hot oil you can pass through there. You will see an oil pressure loss at idle. Uh, like for instance, if you've got uh, twenty thousandths, twenty five thousandths or so preload, or you and then you go to zero preload, you could see as much as a five or six pound oil pressure drop just through that action, because. Remember, this is just one, but you've got 16 of these things going all at the same time. That's a pretty big volume of oil. So at low, at low RPM, when you're not pumping that much volume of oil through the system, this is a big factor in terms of internal bleeding. So that is, that is an oil pressure issue. Keep in mind, if you have a piddle valve style hydraulic lifter, there needs to be some preload to the lifter. Even like 10 thousandths preload is enough to at least make sure that, that this valve stays loaded and only the small amount of regulated oil is allowed to go through that slot. All right, this last valve, uh, lifter here, this is from the Dodge Magnum. Now, let's go back and let's talk about other considerations. One of the ways that the engineers regulate the amount of oil that gets to the top of the engine is through these bands. And you can see these two bands are pretty much identical. These sit at the very top of the oil galley. And you can see that this one is much broader and it reaches down below. Now remember, on these engines, the oil galley is at the same exact height. This band goes lower because the engineers want this lifter to receive more oil during its up and down movement. So... What's happening here is that when these lifters are sitting on the base circle and this band is at the very, very top of the oil galley, it's getting oil. But as soon as the cam moves off its base circle and the lifter starts to rise, this passage is more or less cut off. So what the engineers want is only oil, direct oil to the, to the band, to this feed band, when the lifter is off its base circle. In this case, the engineers wanted a little bit more. They wanted more volume of oil available to the top end or to the, to the lifter and then to the top end of the engine. So they extended the band down a little further. So this lifter has to come further off its base circle before it's cut off. The bottom of the band is cut off. Now, one of the reasons I imagine they did this is because on the Magnum engines, they raised the height of the lifter bore. And so in other words, like everything else is the same, but they raised the height of the lifter bore. And because of that, you have a remote feed to the top of the lifter. So from this feed up here, you're feeding the plunger underneath and you're feeding the rockers up top because Magnum engines oil through the rockers. Here's the interesting thing about this. The engineers wanted more wanted the lifter exposed to oil for more of its distance, more of its travel, but restricted the amount of oil that's actually allowed to go to the top end. The hole, the feed hole on this lifter is smaller than this lifter by a significant amount. So the engineers, when they design this one, they want more duration, which is why the band is wider, but they want less overall feed. 
crazy stuff to take into consideration. So here's something, here's something interesting with this type of lifter. Uh, Harley Davidson. When Harley Davidson uh, designed, when they, when they engineered the Twinkie in the late 90s, in the middle 90s, whenever that, whenever that was, they spec'd a Chevrolet roller lifter, roller lifter body and roller assembly for the Twinkie. And since those engines have, have been around, and actually they, they incorporated them into the sports store around 2000 or so. But for as long as those lifters have been around, guys have been substituting them with Chevrolet lifters, thinking they're exactly the same. But they're not. The Chevy lifter has the same exact body, the same plunger height, the same roller, the same everything. But the holes are a different diameter. Both the hole, the feed hole here, and the hole in the, uh, the pushrod cup are different diameters. Now, as it turns out, the happy coincidence is that the Chevy lifter, which is like half or a third the price of the Harley Davidson lifter, actually functions better. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, as far as preload goes, this type of lifter doesn't use a piddle valve. This uses just, let me put this down, just this slot, so this sits on top of the inner plunger, and you've got a feed slot here, and then you've got a feed hole here. And the amount of oil that's allowed to get through there basically is, is regulated by leakage between the pushrod cup and the body of the lifter. There is no direct passage inside the lifter uh, from the body to this this hole so these things all need to be taken into consideration the diameter of the hole the height of the band the width of the band the holes the type of lifter the type of valving to the lifter all of these things need to be taken into consideration and then here's if that wasn't enough here's yet another thing you have to be aware of so this is this is an LS rocker. All right. So I used this Allen key so so it wouldn't it wouldn't fall out, okay? But the these are timed also. So the diameter the diameter of this hole is regulated that those do vary. The holes in the push rods don't vary. Generally speaking the holes in the push rods are all pretty much the same. But the feed hole in the top of the rocker isn't they'll vary these now here's the interesting thing about this if we take the push rod we see that there's a direct lineup between the hole in the push rod and the hole in the rocker only in one position and this position would be with the rocker closed right with the valve closed as soon as the push rod moves up the oil hole becomes covered, right? So you see there's no, there's no real give here. Once you get to, so in this position, you've got full oiling through the push rod through that feed hole, but then, oh, butter fingers. But then when you operate it through its range, you see that the push rod, the hole, becomes covered. And that limits the amount of oil that's allowed to flow when the rocker is in motion. There is so much to this stuff. And you know what? I tell you what, there's there's even more that I'm not even I'm not even thinking of. After I'm done shooting this video, as always, it always happens. I finish shooting a video and I realize, oh my God, I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention this, I forgot to mention that. But I, I think we're hit for over 20 minutes now, right? <laughs> if you guys hung on this long, you're real champions. Um, there's more to this. There's more to this. But I think I gave you guys enough to like go on to, to at least know that there are differences. And when you do start to mix and match components, you there are things you need to look at. Why was it done this way? That's like the key to like part of hot rodding, part of hot rodding. When you, not when you're building from scratch, but when you're taking components that were already designed and, and functioned together, but now you're going to mix and match. You always have to look, you have to look at every small detail and try to decipher what the engineer was trying to accomplish with this particular move. 
if you if you don't, there are so many ways you could shoot yourself in the foot and end up with a package that doesn't function just right or is set on self-destruction. You know, too little or too much oil getting to the top of the engine can be a real issue, and it's not, it, it's not just it's not just an oil thing. It's every bit of the engine. When you go to hot rod something, you need to take all of the engineer's original ideas and intentions into consideration before you start modifying and then make whatever modifications or, or, or additions you need to to make sure that you get the result that you're looking for. All right. I hope you guys got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.